So for hydrogen and sulfur, we looked at the overlap of standard atomic orbitals and didn't agree with Vesper theory, but otherwise it didn't seem to be too much of a problem. But for a lot of other substances, it just doesn't work to look at the overlap of atomic orbitals. So let's look at one where this just does not work at all. So carbon and hydrogen. So if we look at the orbital diagram for the valence electrons on carbon, we see that carbon has two half-filled orbitals, um, these p orbitals. The s orbital is full, so that's not going to interact with anything. Um, and then there's an empty orbital. So here, what we've drawn is the, the s orbital, that's spherical, that's the blue one. And that has a, uh, a pair of electrons in it. And then we have um, one of the p orbitals here in the x-axis, um, and that has one electron. So that can overlap with the half-filled orbital of the hydrogen. And then we have another p orbital that's in the y-axis that has one electron, and that can overlap with another hydrogen atom and form a bond. The third p orbital would be at this angle, um, and it's not shown because it's empty. So what does this predict? This predicts that um, carbon and hydrogen interacting with each other, we would have a formula of CH2, and that the bond angle would be 90 degrees, right? But in reality, the, the compound that, the simplest compound that forms between carbon and hydrogen is CH4, and it has a tetrahedral geometry and the bond angles are 109.5. And so here we've got definite conflict between these two theories and so something needs to be fixed, right? That this isn't gonna work. So we add this additional concept of hybridization. So the orbitals in a molecule are not necessarily the same as the orbitals in an atom. They can be changed by that interaction. So what we talk about as hybridization, this is a, a mathematical procedure in which you take two standard atomic orbitals and you combine them to form hybrid orbitals. They're not like either of the original things, that's why they're a hybrid, they're kind of parts of both, like a hybrid vehicle can run on gasoline and electricity. So the hybridization is going to correspond more closely to the actual distributions of electrons that we observe in molecules. Um, these orbitals are still going to be localized on the atoms, but their shapes and their energies are going to be different than those standard S, P, D, and F orbitals. So the hybrid orbitals are going to minimize the energy of a molecule by ensuring that there's the maximum possible overlap between those orbitals. So maximum orbit, orbital overlap. Um, and the hybrid orbitals are able to do this because now the electron probability density is concentrated in a single directional lobe. So if we go back and look at, um, at this, here we have this p orbital for carbon. And so the p orbital is on both sides of the carbon atom. And this one electron is occupying both sides with equal probability. So only one lobe of this can overlap with the s orbital of another atom. So when we hybridize the orbital, the orbitals are no longer going to be symmetrical like this. They're going to be more lopsided, and so the bigger side can overlap more with the other atom. Um, Hybridization is not free. It does require some energy, and so it's only going to happen if there's a payback by lowering energy um, from the formation of a bond. So in truth, all the atoms in a molecule will hybridize their orbitals to some extent. We're going to just simplify this a little bit. We're only going to look at interior atoms 
that are hybridizing the orbitals. Any terminal atoms, like hydrogen's always on the outside, it's just attached to one other atom. We're gonna assume that those are having um, just standard atomic orbitals. And it is true that atoms that form more bonds are more likely to hybridize. So I'm gonna try to simplify this a little bit. Um, so some things to keep in mind. Um, the number of standard orbitals that you're hybridizing is going to be equal to the number of hybrid orbitals that you end up with. So I guess you could say the number of orbitals is conserved. You're not gonna gain or lose orbitals by hybridizing. You're just going to change their shapes and their energies. Um, what the particular combinations that you get um, in the hybrid are going to determine the shapes and energies of those hybrids. And the particular type of hybridization, there's lots of different possibilities, the particular one that actually happens in a particular molecule will be the one that gives us the lowest energy. And so calculating that is way beyond the scope of this class. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Vesper theory to predict what the hybridization scheme is. Okay, so let's look at how this could happen. Um, so here we have an energy diagram um, for carbon showing the atomic orbitals for the valence electrons. And we have a 2s orbital and we have a two uh, three 2p orbitals. Remember in the hotel this is the first room on the S floor and it has one bed so it can hold two electrons. The 2p room has three beds it could hold three electrons. right? And the energy of the 2p is higher. Um, so what we're looking at here is what if we take all four of these orbitals and we hybridize them? It's a bit like an average. We're going to average them, right? So we're going to average them, and we're going to end up with four new orbitals that are all the same as each other. So we started with one, two, three, four orbitals. We're going to end up with one, two, three, four orbitals. The energy of these, whoops, the energies of the new orbitals are going to be between the original energies. Like if you think about averaging these energies, the average has to be between the highest and the lowest value, right? So these orbitals are going to be a little more higher in energy than S, but lower in energy than P. So we say those orbitals are degenerate, meaning they're all the same. So if we think about this in our hotel model, if we're looking here at the second floor, so there's the P room, and here is the S room, right? So the P room has three beds in it. We could put a total of six electrons in there, and the S room has one bed in it. We could put two electrons in there. So let's think about, well, what if, you know, we've got cost difference and we've got separation here, right? What if there's a group of people that comes in, a group of electrons, and they're like, but, but we want to all be in the same room. They're gonna remodel the hotel, right? It's gotta play along a little bit here. So if you needed four beds in the same room, then you could remove this wall, right? Take the wall out, now you have one big room and there's the four beds. Since all the beds are in the same room, you have to charge the same amount for each bed. You can't say, well, if you're sleeping in the bed by the door, it's cheaper than if you're sleeping over by the windows, because how are they gonna know which bed you're sleeping in, right? They're not. So we have this original situation I didn't really leave myself any room. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to remove that wall. And so now we have just the one room. The black is the, um, 
the, the walls of the room and the blue boxes are the individual beds, right? So now we've got four beds in the same room, same price, right? Well, we can't call this 2S or 2P anymore, right? Because we've changed it. So we're gonna call this SP3 because we used an S orbital and three P orbitals, and we mashed them together. So SP3, three means I took three P orbitals and one S orbital and zoom. So what does it look like when you hybridize these orbitals? So here we have our atomic orbitals. Um, the S orbital is spherical, and the P orbitals are this kind of dumbbell shape, and they're um, oriented at right angles to each other. So if we take these four shapes and average them together, what we get is four new shapes. And the orientation now is different because these are gonna be spread out equally in space. That's where the S orbital being you know, completely symmetrical is gonna have a big effect on this. And we're also going to see that one of these lobes now is bigger than the other instead of them being the same size. So can you kind of get creative in your imagination and um, believe me when I say that if you average those things together, you could get four things that look like this. I know it's a stretch, but kind of possible. So if we show all four of these on top of each other, it's going to look like this. And that should be a familiar shape now. That's a tetrahedral, a tetrahedron. And it looks like what happens when you have four balloons tied together, right? What we're showing here is only the large lobe of each of these. There's another little puny stunted lobe on the other side. You can imagine if we showed all of those, this would get really hard to look at. So this little puny lobe is there, but it doesn't actually contribute much, and so we're going to just kind of ignore it. So we took these orbitals, we hybridized them, and we get this new arrangement. So here's this carbon with its new hybrid orbitals. And I like how they used color here because the P orbitals were red and the S orbitals are blue. And what happens when you mix red and blue? You get purple, right? So these are the hybrid orbitals. Each one of these has one electron in it. And that one electron can overlap with a hydrogen. So here, if we look at the orbital diagram for hydrogen, So here, here we have one of these hydrogens. It's got an S orbital with one electron in it and an sp3 hybrid orbital from carbon with one electron in it. And those are going to overlap and they can form a bond. So this is going to predict that we're going to have four bonds with hydrogen between carbon and hydrogen and that the shape of this molecule is going to be tetrahedral, not a 90 degree flat thing. And this agrees with experimental observations. Any questions? We can also have lone pairs. Um, if we look at nitrogen, um, so nitrogen's atomic orbital, nitrogen has five valence electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five. Um, this is 2s and this is 2p. And if we hybridize those, we're going to get four equivalent orbitals. And this is going to be called sp3. And now if we put 
five electrons into that room, they're going to get their own beds first. One, two, three, four. And then that last one has to pair up. So now this shows us we have a pair of electrons in this one. That's a lone pair. It's not going to form a bond because that one's full. But each of these is half filled and can overlap with a hydrogen half filled orbital. Because these are hybridized, they're going to have this uh, tetrahedral geometry. And so we're going to see the tetrahedral electron geometry for ammonia. Um, and this one is the lone pair. So the lone pair, as we learned, takes up a little more space. So it's going to push these guys a little bit together. Um, the bond angle is 107 um, instead of 109.5. Um, and valence bond theory explains that because the hybridization is going to be less complete due to the lone pair. Um, okay, so how many sp3 hybrid orbitals will result from hybridizing 1s and 3p orbitals? If I take an s and 3p orbitals and I average them together, how many orbitals will I end up with? The same number of orbitals that I started with. So I started with 1, oops. I started with 1 plus 3. I started with 4 orbitals. When I hybridize them, I don't change the number of orbitals. So when we're remodeling the hotel room, the number of beds stays the same. All we're doing is we're moving walls, changing prices, but the number of beds stays the same, okay? So if I started with one plus three is four orbitals and I hybridize them, how many will I end up with? Four. Oh, I guess that one. So um, let's look at a, a different hybridization scheme here. So here again, we have this illustration with the s orbital and the, the p orbitals, right? Before, what we looked at was taking all of these and hybridizing them together. Well, what if we just want to hybridize three of them? We're going to take the s orbital, and we're going to take two of the beds from the p room. Let's see, maybe I can draw this a little better. So this is the second floor. That kind of look like a bed? So there's the S room and here's the P room. The S room has one bed, one orbital. The P room has three beds. The P sublevel has three orbitals in it. Each of these can accommodate two electrons. So what we did before is we took out this wall. We just completely took it out. So we erased that wall and then what we had was one big room and we call it sp3 because we've got the s bed and three p beds, but they're all together. What we're doing now is instead of just removing the wall, we're going to move it. So here we want three beds in the same room, so we're going to move the wall over here. So we have the S bed and two of the P beds all together. And so that's going to be called SP2. And what about this guy? Well, that is a P bed from the P room, right? And so nothing happened to it. It's still the P room. So this orbital wasn't changed 
we just took these three orbitals and hybridized them together. So what we end up with is the three hybrid orbitals and their energy is between the originals. So the cost of this room is more than the S room but less than the P room. And then we've got this other one that was unaffected and so its energy is the same as it was before and that's this guy. So here we're taking an s orbital and two p orbitals and we're mashing them together to form three new orbitals. So the shapes of these new orbitals are going to be a lot like the sp3 orbitals. The orientation is going to be different though because this was in the xy plane and this was in the um, I mean this was along the x axis and this is along the y axis and so the two of them together would lie in the xy plane. Um, and so all three of these now are going to lie in the same plane. So it's going to be flat. So we've got three things now, and three things are going to make that trigonal planar shape, like three balloons. And doesn't that even look like what you get when you tie three balloons together? They're going to lay flat, right? So H2CO has sp2 hybrid orbitals. The carbon, here are its atomic orbitals, and it's going to hybridize. When it hybridizes, it's going to take this one and these two and hybridize those to make a new room with three orbitals in it, three beds in it. And then this guy remains unchanged. It's still a p orbital. Uh, what am I looking at here? Yeah. So here's the hybridization that occurs on the carbon. And we're going to assume that the hydrogen and the oxygen, because those are on the outside, those are terminal. We're going to pretend that they don't hybridize just to make things a little simpler. So the hydrogen has um, a half-filled orbital and the oxygen has two half-filled orbitals, right? So one of the questions is, well, when we're filling up this new arrangement, why did this guy go to the P room and get his own bed? The rule says that he's supposed to pair up over here instead, right? So this is where we have to fudge a little bit. Um, the energy of these hybrid orbitals is is closer to the p orbital than the s orbital was. And so the energy difference between these now is pretty small. So in the hotel analogy, I think, well, you know, this guy moving up to this other room, you know, it's going to cost him like a dollar a day extra to get his own room with his own bed. Is that worth it to him? Heck yeah. So this guy's going to spread out because the energy difference is just a little bit more. So then each of these orbitals can overlap with one of those. And then we have this half-filled P orbital as well. So yeah, welcome to some funny balloon drawings. So here's the carbon atom. And those are the hybrid orbitals, the sp2. We have three hybrid orbitals, the s and two p's. They're all mashed together, so they're the same now. And they're going to spread out in this trigonal planar arrangement. Each of them has one electron. One of these will overlap with the hydrogen's half-filled orbital. This one is going to overlap with the other hydrogen's half-filled orbital. And the third one is going to overlap with one of oxygen's half-filled orbitals. But there's also a half-filled p orbital that was unhybridized on the carbon. And there's an unhybridized p orbital on the oxygen and those are both half filled and those are going to also overlap but they're going to overlap in a different way so these two orbitals can overlap end to end right and if you think about if you were standing here's your eyeball i don't know if that looks like an eyeball if you're standing here and you're looking down this axis 
that's going to look like a sphere, right? Because you're going to see this being round and that being round and that being round. And if, as you look down, it's going to look like a sausage, right? It's going to be spherical. And we call that an, a sigma bond, just like the sigma kind of has a circle in it and it starts with an S like spherical, right? So that's a sigma bond because the things are overlapping end to end. These guys cannot overlap end to end because they're, they're stuck in their orientation. They're both sticking straight up and down. And so what these guys are gonna do, the originals were like this. No, we, we didn't have that. So what these guys are gonna do is like, they, they just, they want to overlap and so they're gonna like bend over to each other, right? So this guy's gonna bend this way and that guy's gonna bend that way and they're gonna stretch. So they're gonna overlap in that kind of a side to side way. Now you can imagine that this is um, not as good of an overlap as this end to end, right? So this is kind of strained. Um, it's, it's going to not lower the energy as much. It's gonna be a weaker bond. And this one is not called a sigma bond. It's called a pi bond. So if you tip your head to the side, this is um, the Greek letter pi. Kind of looks like that. So that's called a pi bond. So we have the sigma bond, that's the end-to-end -end overlap, and we have the pi bond. Pi bond is p orbitals. The pi bond is always just plain old p orbitals overlapping. So illustrating that. So here we have half-filled p orbitals that are parallel to each other. When they overlap, they're going to have to overlap side to side. Right, so these are kind of bend over and hold hands across this distance or something. Whereas these that are um, aligned along the same axis, they can just overlap the ends. So that's a sigma bond and this one's a pi bond. So we can label the bonds in this diagram. So this is the overlap end to end, right? A sigma bond. So that's sigma, and we put a colon, and then we're gonna indicate what orbitals are overlapping there. So from the carbon, we have this sp2 orbital, and from the oxygen, we just have a regular p orbital. So that's the overlap between sp2 on carbon and p on the oxygen. Over here, we have two other sigma bonds, so the S orbital doesn't really have an end, right? But you can think of it as overlapping with the end of this hybrid orbital. So that's also a sigma bond. We've got the sp2 orbital on the carbon, and that's overlapping with an S orbital on the hydrogen. So that's the label for those guys. This one here is a pi bond and that's an overlap between the p orbital on the carbon and a p orbital on the oxygen. Pi bonds will always be p orbitals. So this is one bond and this together is a second bond. I know it kind of looks like two, but it's only one. So when we look at the Lewis structure for this, we see that there's a double bond between carbon and oxygen. The first bond is that sigma bond between the hybrid orbital on carbon with oxygen. The second bond is this pi bond. So we get a little more insight into this, the bond using valence bond theory than we did with the Lewis model. The double bond between carbon and oxygen actually has two different kinds of bonds. Um, that is not indicated in the Lewis theory, but the double bond in the Lewis model would always correspond to a sigma bond 
and a pi bond in valence bond theory. Pi bonds are going to be weaker because they cannot overlap as well. They're like you know, stretching off to the side instead of just running head on into each other. So that pi bond is weaker and it's easier to break than the sigma bond. Another thing um, is about this rotation. So here we have a carbon that has sp3 hybrid orbitals, and it's forming a sigma bond with a hybrid orbital on this other carbon. Anytime we look at a Lewis structure, that single bond is always a sigma bond, right? So this has a sigma bond. When we have a sigma bond, just a single bond there, So this ball and stick model would be a bit like that. Let's see if I got one of these for one color. So I've got the two white balls. Those are the two hydrogens, right? There's two hydrogens, two hydrogens and one chlorine. The green ball is the chlorine. The black ones are the carbons. And that sigma bond, because it's an end-to-end -end bond, like overlapping your fingers like this, you can twist your hand Right? and it can still be bonded together. This bond can rotate, and it, in fact, it does rotate. And so that molecule, 1,2-dichloroethane, those chlorine atoms could be on the opposite sides, like this, or it could rotate around and be on the same side. If we make a slightly different molecule here, where we have a double bond between the carbons, Now we've got a sigma bond and a pi bond. So looking at this picture here, we've got the sigma bond and here's this pi bond that's above and below. Well, if you want to rotate, I mean, that's like putting two fingers together, right? Now, if you rotate one hand, you can only do it if you disconnect fingers, right? You can't rotate when both of those are bonded together. And here in the ball and stick model, with the two bonds here, I can't rotate this anymore. So there's actually two different versions of this molecule. One where both of the chlorines are on one side, and one where they're on opposite sides. And they cannot interchange without breaking one of those bonds. So here we've got two bonds, and there's going to be no rotation. Here's um, space filling models for the same things. So with the single bond, we have the, the free rotation around that single bond, and this can, um, you can have the chlorines on opposite sides or the same side. When we have the double bond in there, there's no possibility of rotation. And so you can either have the chlorines on the same side or on the opposite side. So there are two distinct forms. This one's called cis because these are on the same side and trans because they're on the opposite side. So trans is opposite, like a transatlantic railroad went across, right? And cis, I think of like sisters being on the same side. Um, this, this one has a lot of words in it. Um, so back in, in chapter 10, we learned that double bonds are stronger than single bonds, and they're also shorter. Um, and here, looking at these specific carbon-carbon single and carbon-carbon double bond, so the single bond is 347 kilojoules per mole, the double bond is 611 kilojoules per mole. 
um, you know, thinking simplistically about this, you might say, well, if this is a double bond, shouldn't the energy be twice as large? That would kind of make sense, right? But it's not. Uh, 2 times 347 is uh, closer to 700, right, than 611. So this isn't quite twice. Why? Why isn't it twice as much, thinking about what we've just learned about valence bond theory? A double bond, right, has that one sigma bond, which is a really good overlap, really strong. And then it's got that pi bond where the, the orbitals are kind of stretching to reach each other. They can't overlap as well. So that second bond is weaker, right? So our choices here, um, because according to valence bond theory, a double bond is actually composed of two different kinds of bond, one sigma and one pi. Um, because according to valence bond theory, a double bond is the sharing of two electron pairs. Or that is, you know, what we're talking about here is an exception, and valence bond theory would predict that double bonds are twice as strong. What do you think? A. Yeah, because it's not twice as strong because it's not two of the same bond. It's one bond, and then the second bond is not as strong, and so it will not be twice as strong. So we can also do a hybridization where we take um, that s orbital and just one of the p orbitals. So here again in the hotel, we're taking that wall and we're just moving it over one bed. So now we have one room with two beds and then the other room with two beds. So this is the P room and all that got changed is we moved the wall over, the rest of it is the same. Here now we took the cheaper room and one of the beds from the more expensive room, we remodeled things. And so these are now the same price, the same energy, and they're going to be higher in energy than S and lower in energy than P. And so this is called um, SP because it's an S and a P. So SP2 is an S and two P's. SP3 is an S and three P's. So here what happens is we've got an S and just one of the P's, and we hybridize those together and again, we get these drumstick kind of things, these lopsided dumbbells. Um, here, one's gonna point to the right and one's gonna point to the left. So if we superimpose them, it's gonna look like this. And again, we're ignoring the little stunted end. So this is telling me to draw the Lewis structure for acetylene which is actually really close to what it's got right there. So what we have here, um, this carbon has two electron groups, right? Um, it's gonna form a single bond with the hydrogen and it's gonna form a triple bond with the carbon. So the carbon's gonna hybridize and so we're gonna take This one and this one, we're going to hybridize those together, and that's where we get this new room with two beds. And again, this other room next door is only a little bit more expensive than this room. So when we put four electrons in there, these guys get their own beds, and then these guys are going to opt to pay the dollar more a day. You know, the room's like a hundred bucks, right? So a dollar more a day is like nothing to have your own bed. So they're gonna spread out like this. We've got four half-filled orbitals. And this is why carbon always forms four bonds, because it's got four valence electrons that can do this. So one of these is going to overlap with the 1s orbital of hydrogen. The other one is gonna overlap with the hybrid orbital of the other carbon. It's gonna look like this. So here we have the two sp orbitals for that carbon and the two sp hybrid orbitals for this carbon. 
So the carbons can form a single bond by overlapping their hybrid orbitals, and they can also form a sigma bond by overlapping with the hydrogen. And then what we have left is each carbon has a p orbital that is unhybridized but half full. So we've got one up and down here. Actually, maybe I should have done this. And one up and down over here. And that can form a pi bond stretching over to the other one where we get this part. So that's one pi bond. But then we also have another pair of unhybridized p orbitals and those are at right angles to the first one and so those can also form a pi bond doesn't that look like it might be a fun pool toy to play with <laughs> big inflatable thing mm. so this is a sigma bond that's between an sp hybrid orbital on one carbon and the sp hybrid orbital on the other carbon. The hybrid orbitals are always going to be involved in sigma bonds. For this carbon, its other hybrid orbital overlaps with hydrogen. And then these two are pi bonds. And pi bonds are always between p orbitals, p orbital on one carbon, the p orbital on another carbon. This shows us, predicts that this molecule would be linear. And that matches up with what, with what we learned about from the Vesper theory. And also experimentation tells us it is a linear molecule. Um, what would the hybridization of carbon be in carbon dioxide? Well, this is, I don't think this is really a very fair question just yet. But let's start with the Lewis diagram for carbon dioxide. And this is where we use Vesper theory to predict what the hybridization is. We're going to look at our Lewis structure and ask ourselves, as we do for Vesper theory, how many electron groups are around the carbon? There's two. Right? So you think about tying two balloons together, what sort of a shape are they going to make? A dumbbell. It's going to be linear, right? You've got one balloon here tied to another balloon there, and overall it's a linear shape. So if we have two groups, that means we need to hybridize two orbitals because we're going to get one hybrid orbital for the first bond in each of this. So if we need two hybrid orbitals, then it's going to be sp. Because if we did sp2, then we'd end up with three. And that the second bond here is going to be a pi bond. It has to be an unhybridized orbital. So this tells me I need two hybrid orbitals, so I'm going to overlap two orbitals. I mean, hybridize two orbitals. Um, so we learned about expansion of the octet. And so what this corresponds to in valence bond theory is that now we're expanding into the D room of the hotel. So we're involving the D orbitals. Um, the energy of those 3D orbitals are similar to the 3S and the 3P. It's a little higher, that's why they don't fill until later, but it's not crazy higher. So if we needed five hybrid orbitals, because we had five electron groups, then we're going to take an s orbital, we'll take the three p orbitals, and then we'll take one from the d. So let's, let's see if I can draw this. Oops, that's not what I meant. Um, it's going to take me too long to draw that many beds. So I'm going to write B for bed. <laughs> so there's the S room. It's got one bed. 
right? And the pee room has three beds. And the D room has five beds in it. So this is a group coming in that says, we need five beds together, but we want it to be the cheapest possible. We're not gonna just skip this and go up here. I know that's it's not a very good part of the analogy, but you can only do so much with this stuff. So we're gonna take out some walls. Ooh, I can actually just move that wall. I'm just gonna move that wall over. Um, so here I've got the S bed and three P beds and a D bed now. And what do I have left over here? These are just beds in the D room. We just made it a little smaller, but here are those four. They're just the same as they were before. Those are unchanged. The rest of these guys now are going to be intermediate in energy between the highest and the lowest. And they're all gonna be the same. And so we're gonna call these, because it's an S and three Ps and a D, we're gonna call it SP3D. So that would be five orbitals, five hybrid orbitals now. They're going to be the same size, the same energy, the same shape, but they'll be oriented in space differently just like five balloons would be, which is gonna look like this, right? And that's that um, trigonal bipyramid, right? There's a triangular pyramid on the top and a triangular pyramid on the bottom. So if we're looking at something like arsenic um, pentafluoride, that's gonna have five electron groups here. So we look at the five electron groups to say we, we need to take five orbitals and hybridize them. And so that's gonna get me sp3d. So you look at your Lewis structure and you ask yourself, how many electron groups do I need? Well, if I need two groups, one, two, SP, right? If I need four groups, one, two, three, four, SP3. Well, what if I need five? Here's where the finger thing kind of breaks down a little bit. One, two, three, four, five, SP3D. Okay, so looking at the electron groups and predicting the hybridization is not difficult. You're just like, okay, I'm, I'm like imagining that hotel floor, right? I've got the three rooms, the S, the P, and the D. I've got one bed, I've got three beds, I've got five beds. And now my Lewis structure says I need five that are equivalent. So I'm gonna take the S room, that's one bed, and I'm gonna take three beds out of the P, that one plus three is four, I need one more, so I'm gonna move over into the D room and take one of its beds. And so we get SP3D, hybridization. What if we need six? home and my family says, oh, you were talking about valent bond theory today. Yeah, we got letters all over my fingers. So if we need six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're starting by the elevator and we're just seeing, well, how, how do we get six beds? I'm gonna take the S room and all of the P room and I'm gonna need to move that wall over so I'm encompassing two of the beds in the D room. Now I've got six hybrid orbitals, same shape, same energy, but they're gonna spread out in space like six balloons and make that octahedral shape. If each of these has one electron in it, they can each form a sigma bond with something else, right? So this would be something like 
uh, sulfur hexafluoride. And the description of each of these bonds, those are going to be sigma bonds. The hybrid orbitals are always going to make sigma bonds. They're going to overlap end to end. They're going to overlap with um, a half-filled p orbital on the fluorine. So we have S sulfur, sp3d2, overlapping with the p on the fluorine. So the hybridization scheme, I mean, how do we know what kind of hybrid orbitals are going to be used? Um, the rigorous method is you calculate it um, to see what would give you the lowest overall energy. We're not going to do that. We're going to settle for good enough for chem 1A, right? Good enough. We're going to assign an electron hybridization scheme from the electron geometry of the central atom. The electron geometry comes from the number of electron groups, okay? This is not 100% accurate, but we're not going to ask you any questions where it doesn't work, okay? So we're going to go for good enough here. So then your book gives you these tables. Um, so if you have two electron groups, we know from Vesper theory that that's going to have a linear geometry. How do we predict what the hybridization is? Well, you know, I've got these letters written on my fingers, right? I, I have two groups. One, two groups, sp. You know, jump down, jump down to this one. This one has four groups. What's the hybridization? One, two, three, four, sp3, right? So that's how we're going to predict what the hybridization is. So these are the instructions to write a bonding scheme. Um, and there is a worksheet about this. So you have to start with the Lewis structure. So worksheet 10 had you drawing Lewis structures for a bunch of different molecules and ions. In worksheet 11, where we're going to be looking at the Lewis uh, valence bond theory, we've got some of those same molecules and ions. And so we're going to use the Lewis structures that you already wrote and now we're going to go to the next step and we're going to use Vesper theory to predict the electron geometry. So that's why on worksheet 10, I asked you how many electron groups are around the central atom, right? And you were like, what the heck is an electron group? And we tried to explain it, but it's still kind of fuzzy, right? So an electron group, it could be a single uh, lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. So a triple bond together is one group of electrons. It's not a pair, it's a group. So it could be six electrons in the group. So we're going to select the correct hybridization based on the electron geometry. Really, it's based on the number of electron groups, which is what the geometry is based on. Um, then you would sketch the molecule. Um, starting with the interior atom and its orbitals, and then you'd label all the bonds using the sigma and pi notation. The good news is I'm not going to make you draw these, in part because I don't want to have to look at your drawings, right, and try to evaluate, is this correct or not? So, but let me just illustrate how this works. So here we're going to write the hybridization and bonding scheme for xenon, um, tetrafluoride. So the first thing is the Lewis structure. So we'll start out with xenon in the middle and try putting those fluorines around it. And then we're going to count up the number of electrons, right, and distribute those. Let's do this. And the, the purpose of this is not to talk about drawing the Lewis structure. But. And then we've got extra electrons, and so they're going to go on the xenon. So that's starting with the Lewis structure. How many electron groups are around the xenon? Six. So what's the hybridization? One, two, three, four, five, six. SP3D2. So the hybridization, because we have six groups, it's going to be sp3d2. 
we need six orbitals, right? So I'm going to start here with my xenon. And six orbitals, like the six balloons, right? Actually, I should make that purple. Because these are hybrid. So there's going to be one up and one down and one coming out to the front and one going back, one going back there, one coming out here. You just kind of have to use your imagination a little bit. And so each of these has one electron. But wait, let's think about this. So my hybridization, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to have my sp3, d2. What happens to those other three d orbitals that were sitting in that room? They're, they're just still sitting there. Nothing happened to them. So on the worksheet, I want you to show those because they're not like disappearing or anything. They were empty before and they're still empty. Just like rooms in a hotel don't disappear if no one's staying in them, right? Orbitals, subshells do not disappear if there are no electrons in them. They're there, they're just empty. So here we've got these empty guys. And so if we look at the xenon, how many electrons, how many valence electrons does it have? It has eight, right? So if we fill this in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now you might say, well, why didn't you put them up there? Well, that's where it gets a little icky. I'm looking at my Lewis structure. My Lewis structure shows me I have two lone pairs. Um, so then I should have two of these that are paired up. So then over here, um, what do I do this way? So I'm going to have a lone pair in one of my hybrid orbitals. And we learned in Vesper theory that where would the other lone pair be? On the opposite side because they take up a lot of space and they try to be away from each other. So I've got these two opposite of each other, and then I've got these four orbitals that are kind of like the skirt, the, the tutu of the ballet dancer, right? They're around the middle. So each of these fluorines, if we look at the fluorines, um, and again, we're gonna pretend that the fluorine does not hybridize. So it's just going to have its regular electrons. How many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven. seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So fluorine has one half-filled orbital. It's a p orbital. So here's fluorine, and it has one orbital that's half-filled, and that's going to overlap with that hybrid orbital on xenon. And here's another fluorine. It also has one atomic orbital, a p orbital that's half full. So here I've got my four fluorines. I know from the um, orbital diagram, they have a half filled p orbital. That's going to overlap. The first bond is always a sigma bond. Hybrid orbitals always form sigma bonds. And so all of these bonds are going to have the same notation, right? It's a sigma bond. And what kind of bond is xenon using? I mean, what kind of orbital? SP3D2. And, and that's going to be overlapping with fluorine, and what kind of an orbital is fluorine using? A p orbital. So this is the bonding description for each of these. They're all the same. So that would be the hybridization and bonding scheme.
And so we could do that for other compounds. Um, I'm not going to do that right now.